Now that we've talked about imines and how they can be made from ketones or aldehydes and primary amines, I want to move to talking about a strategy for the synthesis of amines that relies on the formation of an imine or aminium ion followed by reduction, and it's called reductive amination. Reductive amination is an extremely versatile way to synthesize amines. In other words, it can be used to synthesize a wide variety of amines with different substitution patterns, different groups attached to the nitrogen, and that kind of thing. And there are often multiple ways to achieve the synthesis of a common amine. So let's talk about reductive amination in general first, and then we'll move into specific examples. So in general, the reductive amination strategy proceeds in two stages. First, there's formation of an imine or iminium ion, depending on the substitution pattern of the amine used. And then there's reduction of that imine or iminium to form the final product, which is the substituted amine. So let's say, for example, we're dealing with a ketone or aldehyde. And to represent that in general, I'm going to put R1 and R2 groups here with the understanding that R1 and R2 can either be carbon groups or hydrogens. And let's say that we're working with a primary amine, so one carbon group linked to the nitrogen, let's call that R3. When these two reagents are combined in the presence of an acid catalyst, we know that this will form an imine intermediate. Water will be lost, we can write minus H2O here to emphasize that, water will disappear, and we'll be left with an imine intermediate with a carbon-nitrogen double bond. From an amination perspective, the key point about this step is that we've established a carbon-nitrogen bond. We've established a new bond between carbon and nitrogen. And so we have, in a sense, built a kind of hidden amine from this reaction, assuming that we can replace this carbon-nitrogen pi bond with, for example, an NH and a CH sigma bond. And that's a reduction step, right? That's a reduction transformation. So if we can accomplish that, the final product we'll end up with will be an amine. And to do that, again, just thinking in general, in essence, what we're going to do is first treat with some source of H minus, a reducing agent strong enough to reduce the imine to an amine, and then treat with acid so that we end up with a neutral product. And once we do this, the final product we end up with has R1 and R2 linked to a carbon that now has a new carbon-hydrogen bond. The CN single bond is still there, but the nitrogen has picked up a bond to hydrogen and the R3 group remains there. And so notice that in the overall transformation, what we've done is converted this primary amine that we started with on the left right here into a secondary amine. In essence, we've tacked on the carbonyl carbon and the groups that came along with it onto the amine that we started with. And the two general stages here, first, amine formation, condensation of a carbonyl compound, ketone or aldehyde, and an amine. And the second stage is reduction. And we'll talk about the specific reagent used to accomplish this reduction here in a little bit. Now briefly, it's worth mentioning what happens when we use a secondary rather than a primary amine here because it works totally fine to use a secondary amine with two carbon groups rather than one linked to the nitrogen. So let's call those R3 and R4. In fact, we perform the exact same synthetic steps. First, we treat with catalytic acid. There's a condensation reaction that takes place. Water is lost. But now what we end up with is not a neutral imine, but a positively charged iminium ion intermediate. This iminium ion intermediate is typically not isolated, and actually the same is true of the imine up here. These are immediately treated with the reducing agent, which we're going to call H minus, quote unquote, followed by acidic workup, we'll call that H plus. And this is going to give us now a tertiary amine with the R3 and R4 groups still linked to the nitrogen. But now here again, we've tacked on this group with the carbonyl carbon linked to hydrogen, R1 and R2 onto the nitrogen. And so this is a way to synthesize tertiary amines starting from a secondary amine and a ketone or aldehyde. So just to highlight the substitution patterns, here we get a tertiary amine starting from a secondary amine. And in the first example, we got a secondary amine starting from a primary amine. And of course, it's even possible in theory to synthesize primary amines starting from ammonia using this approach. So extremely versatile approach to the synthesis of amines. Now let's look at specific examples of reductive amination. 
First, I wanted to start with the combination of an aldehyde carbonyl compound with a primary amine. And this leads to a secondary amine product containing a CH2 or methylene. That CH2 is the former carbonyl carbon and the R1 group. And so to highlight here what ends up where, the carbonyl carbon and the R1 group we can see here. And the amino nitrogen H and R2 groups, of course, came from the amine right here. The reducing agent that we use is NaBH3Cn. And if we kind of break this down, it's sodium cyanoborohydride. So it's highly analogous to sodium borohydride in that it's got a sodium cation and some boron containing anion with an overall charge of negative one, but it's different from NaBH4 in that a hydrogen has been replaced with a cyano group. And so let's kind of expand that borohydride anion to get a bit of a better idea what makes this different from the simple borohydride anion. So here's a Lewis structure for the cyanoborohydride anion. And the thing we should notice about this, particularly about the cyano group, is that it's an electron withdrawing group, right? We can draw a resonance form in which the carbon atom is positively charged. That's a reasonable resonance form. Or we can think about this as being inductively withdrawing. There's a dipole moment within the cyano group that goes this way. And what that electron withdrawing effect does is it makes these remaining hydrogens less nucleophilic than the corresponding hydrogens in BH4- or the borohydride anion. And so this reducing agent is less reactive than NaBH4. Now the next natural question is why would we want to do this? Why would we want to use a reagent like this, which is structurally more complicated than NaBH4, probably more expensive, when NaBH4 will, will work perfectly well to reduce an imine to an amine. In other words, in theory and practically, right, if we have an imine in hand, we can use NaBH4 to reduce it. Why would we use sodium cyanoborohydride in reductive amination? This is actually worth thinking about, and I'll return your attention to this original reaction scheme. Think about how this reaction is run and why we might want to use this slightly weaker reducing agent to reduce the imine that forms in the course of this reaction. All right, so the reason we might want to avoid the use of sodium borohydride in this reaction is that sodium borohydride will reduce the starting aldehyde. We know that this reagent can be used to reduce aldehydes and ketones, and this would lead to a product that, at least in this context, we definitely don't want, which is the corresponding alcohol, right, via just simple reduction of the aldehyde or ketone. This would be a bad day in the lab if we were interested in synthesizing the amine, right? Because we didn't even give the amine reactant a chance to engage with the carbonyl compound before it was reduced by sodium borohydride. Sodium cyanoborohydride, because it is less reactive than sodium borohydride, it does not reduce ketones and aldehydes, or at least it does so at a much slower rate than it reduces imines. The nice thing about that is we avoid this problematic side reaction. That's why sodium cyanoborohydride is typically used in reductive aminations. And just to close, I wanted to show three more examples of reductive aminations with different substitution patterns of the amine and carbonyl compounds. So here with an aldehyde and secondary amine, we again end up with a tertiary amine product containing a methylene and R1 connected to the nitrogen. The new carbon-nitrogen bond is here. With ketones, we can end up with either primary or secondary amines, but now we have a branch point instead of a methylene at the carbon newly linked to nitrogen. So here, for example, with a ketone and primary amine, we end up with a secondary amine product containing a new carbon-nitrogen bond where the carbon is linked to two carbon groups because we started with a ketone. And the same thing happens with a secondary amine. We just end up with a tertiary amine product because we started with a secondary amine and we've made one new carbon-nitrogen bond. So hopefully these four examples highlight the versatility of reductive amination. It can be used to synthesize a huge variety of amines. There's very little restriction on the identity of these R groups as long as they're hydrogens or carbon groups. And we can use ketones or aldehydes to achieve different substitution patterns as well. Another thing to note is that working backwards, we can break almost any carbon-nitrogen bond in a target amine and think about making that carbon-nitrogen bond through reductive amination. So a particular amine can be synthesized through reductive amination in different ways.